Well, this morning uh, we come to the sixth of the eight Beatitudes that we find in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. This will be the seventh uh, message that we've had from uh, Matthew chapter 5. We have two more to go in the Beatitudes um, in verses 9 and then verse 10 through 12. And so we've been dealing with this section in detail because I think it's so important that it lays the foundation for everything else that Jesus teaches here in the Sermon on the Mount. In this text today, Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Remember that we have seen that these beatitudes that Jesus gives are what we've said are characteristics of a true disciple of Jesus. That's who Jesus is teaching from verses 1 and 2. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them how blessed, how fortunate, how uh, blessed by God are those who have these attitudes or these characteristics. And so Jesus is teaching us here the initial and the ongoing attitudes of those who are a part of the kingdom of heaven. Remember that these beatitudes are framed in that. Verse 3 where it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then verse 10, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is all about those who are a part of the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. And so we saw that the first three Beatitudes showed us our great need for the grace of God in being a part of the kingdom of God. We must come to God recognizing our own spiritual poverty, poor in spirit we must come mourning grieving weeping over our sin the sin that has has brought us to that impoverished spiritual condition in which we find ourselves and then we come to God in meekness in humility being willing to yield and be controlled by God and giving up that that sense that we are in control of everything ourselves. Weak meekness. Another word for that is humility. And those whose hearts have been prepared like this, poor in spirit, mourning, meek, Hearts that have been prepared by the Spirit of God in that way will will come hungering and thirsting for a righteousness from God that they do not have in and of themselves. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, Jesus says in verse 6, for they shall be filled. Jesus promises here that that the very righteousness that we lack, the very righteousness that we see is of God and we don't have in ourselves the righteousness that we see in Christ, in His sinless, perfect life. The righteousness of God is the very thing that Jesus promises that we will receive. They shall be filled, He says. And remember that that beatitude appears to be kind of the turning point of the beatitudes here. When God, in His grace, gives us the righteousness that we hunger and thirst after through Jesus Christ, God justifies us, giving us the righteousness of Christ by faith, by faith in His life, His death, and His resurrection, and then we, after we have received that positional righteousness in Christ, then we, God imparts His righteousness to us so that we begin to live pr- that practical righteousness that God has given to us in Christ. 
we begin to live out the life of Christ in our lives. And how does it look? Well, that's the rest of the Beatitudes that we had. Uh, last week we had, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. We become those who show mercy because we've received mercy. And because we receive mercy and show mercy, God promises the blessing of receiving more mercy from Him as well. We become those who forgive, who have compassion, who have pity on others and who care in that way just as Christ has shown us His compassion and love. Today we see that another characteristic of those who have uh, received the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ is that they are the pure in heart. The pure in heart. So that now that we've been given the righteousness of Christ, we, uh, we become those whose hearts have been purified. And the blessing that is promised is, for they shall see God. Well, let's consider this beatitude by just asking two questions of it. Um, the first one is this, what does it mean to be pure in heart? That's the first half of the beatitude. Blessed are the pure in heart. I want to talk about a couple different words here. One of those is the word heart. Blessed are the pure in heart heart. In the Bible, the heart is more than just the organ that pumps the blood throughout your body. Uh, it is also more than just the seat of your emotions and your affections. We often speak of the heart as, as uh, you know, I loved you with my heart, not my head or something like we talk about the difference between that, but the Bible doesn't see it that way. Most often when the Bible speaks of the heart, it speaks of the whole center of one's life, of one's soul. Physically, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, morally, the, the heart speaks to all of those things. The heart was considered to be the fountain out of which everything about a man or woman pours out. For that reason, the Bible teaches that the heart is crucial. Solomon writes in Proverbs 4.23, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Now to the scribes and Pharisees whom Jesus will speak about later on here in chapter 5 of Matthew in the Sermon on the Mount, to the scribes and Pharisees they, who were concerned about spiritual hand washing and outward religious appearance, Jesus said in Matthew 15, 11, not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth defiles a man. And then Jesus explained this to his disciples later in Matthew 15, 18, where he said, but those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart. And they defile a man. For out of the heart, listen to this, Jesus says, out of the heart precede evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornication, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 12, 34, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And he said in Matthew 12, 35, a good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good things. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure, brings forth evil things. In other words, behavior is birthed in the heart, both good 
and evil. It is that from which everything in our life comes, the heart. Jesus speaks of the heart as the fountainhead of our life. The heart is the whole inner person. And it expresses itself in every aspect of our life. In his teachings, Jesus repeatedly focused on the heart. He uh, always was focused on the inner person rather than just the outward appearance. Later in this same sermon, Jesus will teach in chapter 5, verses 27 and 28, He will say, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not commit adultery. That's an action that we take on the outside. It's an external action, but what does He say? That's not where sin begins. That's not where sin really resides. He says, But I say to you, that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her, where? In his heart. In his heart. The heart is so precious to God that it is not to be defiled with thoughts or even desires for sin. Again, Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What we desire, what we love, what we treasure is an indication of the condition of our heart. In Matthew chapter 13 verse 19, Jesus says that the word of the kingdom is sown in the heart. In Matthew 15, 8, Jesus quotes from Isaiah prophesying about the hypocrites. And he says, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips. But listen, God's not happy with that. God's not just looking for external uh, worship. He's not just looking for us to go through the motions in worshiping God. He says, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. That's what God's concerned about. In Matthew 18, 35, Jesus says we must forgive from the heart. In Matthew 22, 37, Jesus says that the greatest commandment is this, you shall love the Lord your God with all your, what? heart with all your soul with all your mind the heart is the real issue with God the Bible tells us the Lord does not see as man sees for man looks at the outward appearance but the Lord looks at the heart Jesus said blessed are the pure in heart because that's what God is concerned about most your heart well, what does it mean to have a pure heart? What does it mean to be pure? The term pure is the Greek word from which we get our English word catharsis, which means a cleansing of mind and emotions. Scholars suggest that the word basically has two meanings. First, it means to make pure by cleansing from dirt, filth, or contamination. It's a cleansing, a purifying, uh, taking out everything that is, is a contaminant. It was often used to describe metals that had been refined by fire until they were free from impurities. It was also used for soiled clothes that had been washed clean. It was used of grain that had been carefully sifted to remove all impurities. And thus it would mean in, in the spiritual sense, in the sense of a person, it would, a, a pure heart would mean a heart that is morally cleansed and free from the corruption of sin and guilt. A pure heart. 
Second, this word pure also refers to being unmixed. You might say unadulterated. That it means to not having a double allegiance. In his commentary on this passage, Warren Wiersbe writes that the basic idea is that of integrity, singleness of heart, as opposed to duplicity or a divided heart. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. You can't have a divided heart. You can't have an impure heart before God. So Jesus wants us to be single-minded in the to the to the very depth of our being, pure in heart. James 1:8 teaches that the double-minded person is unstable in all his ways. It reminds me of Elijah on, on Mount Carmel where he says to uh, the people of Israel that they, he, he asked them, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, worship him. If Baal is God, worship him. Right? Pure in heart means we're not wavering between the two. We have a single-minded commitment and devotion and love to God alone. So a person with a pure heart is one who has a single-minded devotion to the Lord God and a life that has been cleansed and is free from all sin. And herein lies our problem, doesn't it? The Bible teaches us that because of sin, the sin of our first parents in the garden, and our own sin, that we are all born into the human family with hearts that are unclean in the sight of God. The individual sins that we commit are simply expressions of the corruption that's already resident in our hearts. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And then in the next verse, Jeremiah gives the answer. The Lord, through Jeremiah, gives the answer. He says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. Why? Because his doings are a fruit of his heart, right? A heart, he says, that is desperately wicked. In Genesis 6, 5, before the Lord calls Noah, he looks at the world that he had created, a world of men. And he says this, Then the Lord saw the, that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. This is a problem for all of humankind, for all of us. Romans 1 tells us that because of our sinful rebellion against the God who made us, that our foolish hearts are darkened. Matthew or Romans 1.21. Paul writes that in uh, Romans chapter 2, verse 5, he says, In accordance with the hardness of your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourselves wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Hebrews speaks about an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, a heart that is hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Psalm 66, 18 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. That's the bad news, right? Here's the good news. God has a cure 
for an impure heart. He is able to cleanse our hearts, even to give us a new heart. And that is his intention in the new covenant in Jesus Christ. In Ezekiel 36, the Lord prophesies and says, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take your heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. God himself promises to cleanse the hearts of people. He is the one who gives a new heart, a new spirit, one that will desire to walk in his ways rather than to rebel against him. Listen, the Bible is clear that although we are commanded as believers in Jesus Christ to purify our hearts, and we are encouraged to, to be, be sanctified. And, to, and, and, and there are things that the Bible commands us to do in cleansing ourselves. That the that initial cleansing that everyone needs, that new heart and new spirit, can only come from God himself. No one can cleanse their own hearts. God must do it. And he does it to everyone who trusts in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Purifying their hearts by faith. Acts, Acts 15, 9 says. Hebrews chapter 9 speaks about this. Hebrews 9, 13 and 14. It says, For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes, ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh speaking about the Old Testament uh, sacrifices that the priests would make, then he says this, how much more, listen, how much more shall the blood of Christ, that's the death of Christ, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ upon the cross, he says, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, his purity, his righteousness, right, being offered, he says, how much more shall he cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? It's God who cleanses our hearts and our minds through Jesus Christ who died for our sins upon the cross. Peter writes in 1 Peter 1, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. We're able to have a pure heart because we have obeyed the truth. We have believed on Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection for the forgiveness of our sins. And God has graciously given to us a new heart and a new spirit cleansing us from sin. And that initial cleansing of the heart is an act of God's grace that he performs on us once. When we place our trust in Jesus Christ. He washes us from the guilt of all of our sins. This is what the, the theologians call positional sanctification. Sanctification is a word that simply means God's making us holy like himself. He's making us pure. He's cleansing us. And so sanctification really has three parts to it. It's really the three parts that we have in salvation. Because we have this positional sanctification. In fact, many times in the New Testament when it speaks about sanctification, it's speaking of positional sanctification. That God has declared us to be clean in His sight. He has made us to be that way. But God doesn't stop there. He also works in us cleansing us with a progressive sanctification. 
This is a cleansing of the heart in which as we mature in our walk with Jesus Christ, as we are being led by the Spirit, the Spirit of God progressively removes from our life, from our hearts, the sin and the divided loyalties that get in the way of our complete devotion and love to Jesus Christ. Jesus told his disciples in John chapter 15, he said, I am the true vine, my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. And here he uses that, that same word where he says, when... Uh, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. The word there is that word purifies, cleanse. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. Prunes, clarifies, he cleanses. Um, that it may bear more fruit. And then he says, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Do you see it? There is an initial positional cleansing of the heart. You are already clean, he told his disciples. And there is a subsequent progressive cleansing where he says every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, he further cleans. Every day, we need more cleansing from God through his Holy Spirit. We need that progressive sanctification. Our hearts have been washed absolutely clean by the blood of Jesus Christ so that God receives us as His children who are born again as the children of God. We belong to Him. We are a part of His body, the church. But as long as we live in the midst of this sin-saturated world, there's no getting away from it. We find that the the world around us presses against us with its sinful values and its priorities. And, and we, we find that our old human flesh even fights against our new spirit and heart that we have so that we often stumble and fall into sin. We're like people who as Jesus uh, speaks about in John chapter 13, we're like people who have full, fully bathed, but who need to wash the world's dirt off our feet when walking in a dirty world. Or as we grow ever closer to the Lord Jesus Christ, we, uh, we often find that sinful habits practices that we've had from our old life need to need to be cleansed and uh, they still need to be washed out every day we need to follow the example I think of of King David who had that great prayer at the end of Psalm 139 where he says search me O God and know my heart try me and know my anxious thoughts See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So there is a positional cleansing of the heart. There is a progressive cleansing that follows it. And finally, the Bible also promises an ultimate perfect cleansing. It's Jesus' intention that we enjoy eternal fellowship with him in heavenly glory without any contaminating effect of sin whatsoever. That's his plan for us. That's the kingdom. That's the ultimate kingdom of heaven. Paul wrote that the 
that Christ loved the church and he said he gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. He wrote to the Colossian believers and he said, In you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, he has now reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. This is God's plan for you. That you would be holy, blameless, perfect, without blemish, completely pure before him. Jude also at the end of the t- uh, this tiny New Testament letter promises that this is our destiny in Christ. He says, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. That's what we have to look forward to. Now those of us who have been granted this positional cleansing of the heart by faith in Jesus Christ and who have who faithfully submit ourselves to the lifelong progressive cleansing by the Father through the ministry of the Holy Spirit and His Word, we can be, a, we can be assured of the perfect cleansing when our life on this earth is over. Then we will be made to stand before God in glory without any sin, without any blemish, without any imperfection. What what a great thing that we have to look forward to. No wonder Jesus says, blessed, blessed are the pure in heart. Let me remind you of what the Apostle John has written in 1 John chapter 3. He said, behold, What manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the children of God. Therefore the world does not know us because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. This is that ultimate, that perfect purification that we will have on that day. But do you know how John applies that to our lives in the very next verse? This is 1 John chapter 3, verse 3. He says, those who have that great hope of the, of the perfect, eternal cleansing of, of, and purification that we'll have in the glory of God where we see Him and we'll be like Him for we will see Him as He is. He says, and everyone who has this hope, is that you? Is everyone who has this hope, he says, in Him purifies Himself even as he is pure. He says, we continue on that that life of progressive sanctification by the power of the Holy Spirit in obedience to the word of God because we have this great glory awaiting us. That leads us finally to consider this final question, what blessing is promised to the pure in heart. Well, that verse in 1 John just leads us right into it, isn't it? For they shall see God. Seeing God. Seeing God has, I think, both a present and a future aspect to it. You know, it's, it's not the physical sight of God in this life that we are promised fact the Bible says no one has seen God at any time not physically even those who had a vision of God did not see God completely Moses in 
in uh, the book of Exodus. He, he asked to see the glory of God. God hides him in a rock and lets his backside pass before him. And he sees somewhat of the glory of God. But he, and, he, and although he, he said to speak to God face to face, it's, it's, it wasn't a physical seeing with his eyes the glory of God in that way. That, that physical seeing with our eyes awaits that perfect purification that we have in heaven. But in some ways, we don't have to wait to see God. In Psalm 19, David says, the, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows His handiwork. Day unto day it utters speech. Night under night reveals knowledge. Remember during the 1960s, the United States and the Soviet Union were, had embarked on this space race. We were all trying to get men up into space as quickly as possible. And... Uh, of course, the Soviets outdid us, and they got their cosmonauts up into orbit before we did. And uh, it was in this tension of, of uh, the Soviets really attempting to undermine the confidence and the foundation of our nation, one of those being really an ultimate belief in God as our creator and sustainer. It was in this tension that the Soviet cosmonauts declared as they got up into space, we looked for God and we did not find him. They got up into space, into the heavens, and said there is no God. In contrast, some American astronauts that were believers saw the glory of God revealed in the heavens. And they read, even as they orbited the earth later on, they read from Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. One did not see God, the other did. And it was not a matter of nationality or political ideology that caused the difference. It was what Jesus said here. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The condition of the heart dictates whether you will see God. God will not be seen. God will not be seen by an unprepared or impure heart. For such, such a heart, a hard heart, a calloused heart, a blinded heart, it, it, it blinds the eyes and it, it blinds our understanding and perceiving of God. David, a man after God's own heart, even saw God in, in his imperfect and aging body if you look at the rest of psalm 139 he declares how he was fearfully and wonderfully made he saw the very glory of god in his flesh that god had created only the pure in heart have this type of sight they see god even in imperfect things like creation because it still bears the marks of a perfect God. Believers also see God in, in difficult circumstances. We saw this in Joseph in the book of Genesis. After his father died, uh, father died, his brothers pleaded with him not to treat them harshly. And remember what Joseph said, as for you, you meant it to harm me, but God intended it for a good purpose so that he could preserve the lives of many people as you see to this day. He could see God in the terrible circumstances of his life. Job also saw that even after he'd lost his family and, much, and, and his business and, and, and was reduced 
to uh, to just weeping in ashes before God. He said, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. To him, both the blessings and the trials came from the hand of God. He could see God in those things. God works all things to the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. Believers see God in acts of worship. The purer our hearts are, the more we see and experience God. As we study God's word, as we pray, as we fellowship with others, as we serve, when our hearts are not pure, we, we, we will go to the scripture and we'll receive nothing. We'll, wor- we'll try to worship or pray and it's, it's like the heavens are shut. We'll serve, it'll only be a burden. God reveals himself to those whose hearts have been purified. Psalm 12, 6 tells us that the words of the Lord are pure. Psalm 119, verse 9 says, How can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. In John 15, 3, Jesus told his disciples, You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. In John 17, 17, Jesus prays, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. God works our progressive sanctification through the knowing and doing of his word. You want to be purified? Get into, prayerfully get into the word of God and know it and live it. And God will do that work in your heart. Seeing God also has a future aspect. We've already said this. We will know him even as he knows us. We will see him even as he sees us. That's the great hope for believers. In John 17, Jesus prayed for his disciples. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am that they may behold my glory, which you have given me, for you love me before the foundation of the world. The greatest thrill to the heart of every believer is to be able to see the glory of God in Jesus Christ. And the great joy of our Savior, Jesus The thing that he himself desired was that we would be with him in heaven and behold the glory that the Father had given to him. To see God, we have to come through Jesus Christ, him alone. No one has seen God at any time, but the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father He has declared him. We must come through Jesus. Jesus would say, he who has seen me has seen the Father. And so to be in heaven and forever to behold the glory of Jesus that had been given to him before the world began, this will be what it means to see God. Blessed indeed are we who are the pure in heart, for we shall see God. Does that motivate you to go out and be increasingly pure in the way that you live? You're going to see God. Are you prepared for that? Let's stand together as we pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we come to this time of invitation, do your work in every heart. You know, God, the the condition of our hearts. You know if we are pure 
in your sight or not. God, I pray that even now you do that work in the hearts and lives of your people for your glory. In the name of Jesus, amen.